year of New Romantics, a dandy, a door whore, and an 80s pop legend. Incredibly, it's been 30 years since Bizarre released their huge dance floor hit. An era defining fade to grey. And to celebrate this, Universal have released The Face, the very best of Visage, including many of the 12-inch remixes. He's working on a new album with Visage due to be out in March. He's creating a new book with a V&A called A Blank Canvas. And after featuring in David Bowie's Ashes to Ashes, Steve leads the way in new romantic style, music and fashion. The 80s are synonymous with, the, with this subculture, and today we have the real deal with us. I'm, de I'm, delighted. <laughs> I'm delighted, and I'm sure you are, to welcome Steve to Southampton Solent and in conversation with me. So today we're going to look a take a closer look at his kind of wider social and cultural influences, and there will be time for questions at the end. So please, can we put our hands together to welcome Steve? To <laughs> Okay, so Steve, you've become a bit of a national institution, a bit of a national treasure. Did you ever consider yourself an important linchpin in changing pop and fashion culture? Um, if you knew where I was born, I don't think anybody would ever have thought something would have actually inspired to come out of such a tiny mining industry town as Newbridge in South Wales to become uh, somebody that changed the face of Clubland and started a musical revolution and a style movement. Newbridge was synonymous for the working men's pits and rugby men and that's if you stayed there that's what, that's what, what your job was going to be. So I knew at the age of 12 when I dyed my hair red and would got known as the village freak that I was out of there at the age of 14 on the first, actually it wasn't even a train, I hitched to London and started working for Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood, so I sort of fell on my feet really. And when did you work in London? What year was that? 1992. I'm dyslexic, so I don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you are renowned for the Bits Club, and it's known to have been a place where all the right people were. In 2005, in whatever happened to the gender vendors, the Blitz was said to be reminiscent of the 1930s cabaret scene, and really it, it influenced a generation. So it's also known as a safe haven because everybody was hand-picked before they went in, and you developed the <coughs> door. What was your policy for getting into the club? Okay, what happened, first of all, was when punk started out and before the Sex Pistols, done the Anarchy in the UK tour, there was a very sort of select group of indiv individuals called the Bromley Contingent that was myself, Susie and the Banshees, Billy Idol, um, Philip Salon, a guy called Berlin, and a couple of other people. Um, <coughs> after a while, um, punk had become very well widespread, and then the Sex Pistols did the Bill Grundy, the very infamous Bill Grundy show, where they swore, called him like a dirty bastard, and all of these... To that, on today's TV, it, nobody would blink an eyelid, but it caused a front page of national newspaper and the whole Anarchy in the UK tour was cancelled. <coughs> um, I was then doing sort of artwork for the, for the pistols. Um, but what has happened is, after the Anarchy tour, lots of dates got cancelled and um, a whole inbreed of media had got attached to the punk rock movement and also um, the National Front and skinhead bands like Sham 69, Screwdriver. And it had become very much like a violent thing. Like if you were wearing Vivian Westwood's edition with your sex trousers, you were not classed as being an original punk, which the, origin, the original thesis of punk started at the world's end, at sex, where Vivian shop was. And then obviously there was the Teddy Boy thing and the one well, National, National Front meeting. And it got very much like a gimmick, and the newspapers were telling you how to put a safety, break a safety plate, put it in your nose, and how to rip your clothes. Basically, it became the uniform punks. And it was something that, not just me, but there was like a group of us which were getting very 
pissed off, really, and it was like as if it was no longer our scene because it had been taken over by the media. And also, you <coughs> didn't know if you were going to go to see Susie and the Banshees without getting your head kicked in, or you know, you're definitely going to end up in a fight somewhere along the line. Anyway, myself, and who then became my business partner, Rusty Egan, we started looking around for various nightclubs because London was boring. It was Thatcherite years, very grey, very bleak, in the sense of kids didn't have anywhere to go. The whole um, music scene was just basically Studio 54 in New York, disco, crap music. Uh, while I was working with the Pistols in, um, in, Paris, in France, I'd collected bands music like Nina Hagen, uh, Lizzie Mercedes Clock, uh, Rusty being in Berlin with Kraftwerk. <coughs> um, we then started to find this venue, um, and it was for like-minded people that sort of were, were individual in their way. They moved from punk and they were sort of creating their own original creativity about them. And because of the people that were getting into Billy's, because it was such a small venue, it was like 150 people, um, I didn't want people that were coming in there to be looking at me dressed as a toy Russian soldier or um, one of my other outfits maybe was like Russian Revolution or... We had like the basis, we had um, like, a, like a costumeus that was like having a sale. So they would, this costumeus were actually dressing everything in a national opera we were allowed access to this three storage sale. I remember it was like a dress up box, so you could go from anything, from any like character, from historical, like pirates, to Robin Hood, to Robinson Crusoe. And that's basically what was happening. But it was myself, um, Philip Salon, um, Billy Idol, who moved away from punk with myself. Um, a character called Boy George, Princess Julia, who was then just plain old Julia. A couple of other people that were synonymous and wouldn't have made the scene happen, that actually became known in their own right, like Stephen Jones, the millionaire who made my fantastic hat, made all my hats, the one that's on the television now. Um, as, part, as part of the policy, you spoke earlier about this kind of Theatrical versus creativity. Were there kind of things that you wouldn't let in? Yeah, definitely. Um, also, it was like the reason I was so strongly and um, such a bastard on the door, and the stick came very handy. <laughs> no, you're not going in. <laughs> and I used to have a compact in my hand, and if they looked absolutely ludicrous, like somebody in the makeup today did the black face, this is side, and white this side. And I remember somebody turning up to Blitz with a face painted black and this was like white. But they were dressed in a wetsuit with flippers. <laughs> so I said, where the fuck do you think you're going? I said, <laughs> the River Thames is that way. And I said, I was a combat. I said, they go fishing, it's that way. And, and also, it was, I didn't think I just saw it as a, a power tool. But we used to sort of play little games, especially when George became a sort of known and synonymous with this boy George um, doing the folk for him. We used to have like little power games at the front to see how many times people would go around the block to get to try to get in. Have you sent anyone away? Um, yeah, most probably about 300 people. Who, who, was, who was the most famous for you? Most probably Mick Jagger. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why was that? Was there, a, was there a story behind that? Yeah. Um, we'd moved from the club that we found, first found, which was Blitz. And the reason we had to move from Burley's to the Blitz because it just spiraled out of all, like, out of within two months from like 150 to 300 people. So we needed a bigger venue. And also, Burley's was actually a brothel, <laughs> which we didn't know when we first went there. So we had to let what we call working ladies of the night venture in and mix with our girls, which was really really, because they were quite scantily clad first as well. And uh, so when we found the place, it was like, it was, we couldn't have wanted a better place. 
um, it was the decoration was um, 1940s, like as if it had been bombed. Um, all posters on the walls were of London, at, um, at London at, at being raided, and you've got all the bombs dropping. What was its capacity? About 250, um, 150 downstairs, about 150 upstairs. Um, We've had two warnings, like from the fire brigade, saying you are well over your capacity, you're getting 300 people in there. Now, if you have any more people, this is the second. This is the second warning. You get one more warning. It's not just you. We know you're here just for t Tuesdays and Thursdays, but the shutters are going down. The club man is losing the license. That means door men, security, bar staff, waitresses. The club is actually closing. And then Mick Jagger turns up, <laughs> pissed. And it's like, don't you know who I am? <coughs> yeah, of course I know who you are, but I'm sorry, I can't let you in. But don't you know who I am? Yeah, I know who you are. And luckily there was somebody with him who was a friend of mine um, from a very salubrious family, the Guinness era, Sabrina Guinness. And I caught her eye and I said, look, Sabrina, I'm sorry, I just, I just can't let you in. I said, the two guys across the road from basically the from the fire brigade and they're going to close this down if any more people come in. Now there was a hack from the mirror in the sun who literally must have ran. But before I got home, it was the front page of the sun and the mirror that Steve Strange turns away with the joke. Well, not only did that make the club an overnight success, it just made 300 crowds escalate to probably about 1,000. So, the, queue, the, do, the, the job of holding a cane became uh, not just a cane, but applying two more security. Because I got not just called a bastard, I was called everything else on the side by turning people away. Yeah, they thought I got a kick out of it, but I was doing it purely out of, like, for instance, we would think that the way that we were dressed, <coughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't something that was nine to five. The way we dressed, it was us going out to work, and then we'd go from work to the blip. So it was us, we would say to people, what are you looking at? We're on stage 24-7, this is us, this is us. So think, thinking about how you look, I mean, you and George are perhaps the most synonymous part of, of the blip, of the blip of Why do you think people found you, George, the whole Roman romantic movement, why, why do they find it so visually arresting? I think <clears throat> because I didn't want once people were inside the club, as I said, I wanted them to be as creative, to be outrageous, as individual as they liked, as long as it as long as it worked, as long as they didn't look daft or like stupid, like in flippers and in a wetsuit. Um, you know, they had to have a, a, a look about them to get past me on the door. Um, and like I said earlier, if we spawned the likes of Galliano, Stephen Jones. Like <coughs> people that are no longer with us anymore, like interior, and not just designers or milliners or interior designers. <laughs> We've paved the way for Visage, Ultra Fox, Soft Cell, Duran Duran, the house band of Spandau Ballet, and Depeche Mode. <coughs> so we, what, we, what we, unbeknownst to us at the time, were creating is we were crea creating a fashion and a, a youth movement which was also creating a music phenomenon as well, which at the time, in 1982, there was 16 electronic bands in America, in the top top 50 in America, which hadn't been done since. No, no British bands has had that much impact on the American charts since the Beatles in the 60s. Amazing. So ID was cited as coming up with the term New Romantics. What, what was the ethos, the vision, was there was there kind of an, an idea behind that, do you think? The reason the New Romantics stuck, uh, two girls interviewed me earlier, one, I can see her right there, from New Forbes. <laughs> 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 she um, uh, sort of asked me about other names that were put to us before the New Romantics. We were called the cult with no name. We were called the Blitz Kiss, as the club is behind me. Um, we were called Blitz Kids, we were called the cult with no name. Um, the reason that nothing was sticking with us was because we were always evolving and changing. 
our makeup was changing, our clothing was changing. Um, and then, uh, slowly, the media were actually getting involved. And we, but we were trying to keep the media at the house of it all the time. Um, I did the same, I think, if I'm not right, I don't know if I did was before the face or after, maybe the same time. Um, but they were synonymous to, like, to be there, like the video photographers, they became, not just ID, it became uh, like, like a celebrity hangout. I mean, if it wasn't like Mick Jagger, it would be David Bowie or Brian Ferry and various people like that. And as I said, it was instigators for St. Martin's and various people. I've heard, I've heard also that some futurists. That's it, nothing. Is, is that, yeah. 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 Is that talking about how you were thinking about the future in relation to how punks thought about the past, perhaps? You know? I think it was more to do with the way that our clothing was more like Dr. Spock and <laughs> <laughs> the clothing big shoulder pads out of here. So we looked more like space cadets. And did you see that carrying through? Because last year you reinvented the blip at Reincarnation in Soho. How did that go? Um, I think in today's culture of clubland, what we were trying to do for the club kids was try to give them a bit of history, but not on sort of a regular. Uh, it was never going to be every night of the week. It was going to be maybe once a month or in a hopefully different venue. But because it sort of worked at the Green Carnation, we did it for about six months there, and it worked very well. And then we sort of decided that we were going to change it around, but in today's ethos, I don't think like club kids are, have got. I just don't think they had. Um, maybe it was that we just had the balls and we just didn't care, and we just, you know, we we thought we were great and we thought we could conquer the world and we went out and we conquered the world and you know like the saying was going it was that right britain it was grey as i said earlier it was very dismal and the saying was the ship was going down but as the ship was going down we were going to party harder mm -hmm. and partying harder was certainly somewhere where fate of grey perhaps launched you to thinking about fate of grey it went to number one in nine countries and one music video of the year 13. 13? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 13 countries. Princess Julia was a part of that. How did that collaboration come around? Come about? Because we couldn't afford <laughs> to fly in the girl who actually sang the French uh, lyrics. Because um, Godly and Creme, who directed the video, uh, I wanted them to do the video because they'd, all, they'd always been musical sort of uh, aspirations, inspirations of mine. And, um, I'd seen a couple of pilot videos them, and I was like, oh, I'd really wish they'd do this video. And I was told by my record company that I've got £5,000, and I was like, that's fuck all. You know, that won't even get me, like, the studio to do, so literally, I was calling on my secret weapon, Richard Shara, my makeup artist, to basically favour us, and Princess Julia was my flatmate. She wasn't a princess at the time. She was just playing on Julia Fodor. Who talks a bit like that. Hello, love. All right. Not a French accent anywhere else in sight. And that's why there's a lot of this going on. Is it true that she can't, is it true that she can't speak French? No, she can't speak So it's, she's, she's my That's why there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. So thinking about Richard Shara and, and she's working with him, I mean, how did you manage to get him to come on board? Um... Money. <laughs> uh, I think he just sort of saw me as amused, basically, and me and him just clicked, and I come up with these like like the makeup that's on there now, and, and he'd be like, "Right, you bitch, get your head back." And he'd go, "Are you going to do this?" And I said, "No, no, 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 don't do it like that. I want this here, I want that there." Um, and he was just like a genius, and it was like I was a blank canvas that would give him some of the ideas. And we, we clicked, and then Richard became very, very wanted in the fashion because his work was seen as being works of art. So he was being booked for commercials, he was being booked for fashion shoots. So when I brought him, wanted to book my secret weapon, sorry, I double booked. So I had to find a secret double weapon which came in the name of Phyllis Cohen. 
which I was very greatly reminded of today in another famous brilliant makeup artist. Um, and Richard, when Richard went, it was sort of like, but I was, I was very lucky as well, don't forget, I had somebody by the name of Robin Beach and Herb Schultz, not Richard before that was on, um, um, two brilliant photographers at Robin Beach, both got books out by the v and um, I'm really lucky to have a lot of these images which have not been seen being put into my book which has been done by the v and now. <coughs> Um, most probably next September, because my new album comes out in March. <coughs> and is that recorded? Is it done in dust series? Are you still it, working on it? It's my, my vocals and the, the tracks are all written um, and it's virtually produced. It just needs uh, Lauren Zabel, who's my new, not French, although she sounds French, um, lead vocalist. Mm -hmm. She just needs some backing vocals on two of the tracks and then it's ready to go to print. What do you think originally made Fated Race so explicit? I, you know, whenever I sing it now, I mean, you know, just recently, for the 30th, 30th time, that would make me prehistoric. <laughs> for the third decade running, it's just been voted um, the best song in Germany. And um, when I sing it, like, people are like, aren't you bored of singing that song? And I'm like, no. I, mean, I, I, I hope on my new album I've got another Fade to Grey on there, mm. at least mm. a Fade to Grey, or a Night Train, or <laughs> my new toy at least, anyway. And it's called Digital World, the new album. That's the album, Digital World. Well, we look forward to that. Thinking more about kind of going back to the Blitz and, and Visage and how it all came about, I mean, you worked with David Bowie on Ashes to Ashes, and you were famously appeared in a video with Princess Julia as well. How did that come about? Julia wasn't in oh, Ashes to Ashes, no. Okay, so how did you get into, this, into, into the video and work with David? Um, David came to the Blitz, and it was my, I mean, <coughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't say that he was my idol in the sense of, I don't want to say that I aspired to want to be like him, but when I was 12, when I dyed my hair orange and new red, I mean, obviously it was music that I wanted, and I was like the freak from the village with bright orange hair. Um, but when he came to the Blitz and he sent his PA, a very arrogant French woman by the name of Coco, and she said, David wants you upstairs now. And I had to make like a lot of leeway with security because I thought fuck if anybody knows that Bowie's in this club it's going to be like pandemonium. So I had to make sure we got him in the back way, got him upstairs without hardly anybody knowing. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, shit, I've got nobody on the downstairs doorway to stop people going upstairs, which by that time word had got out that Bowie was upstairs and I've never seen a club downstairs clear so quickly in all my life. It was like if the, if the fire alarms had gone off that night, we would have all been up in flames. But anyway, <coughs> after, after what I said, I'm sorry, I can't go up there now. I'm still doing the door and I have to do the door. It took about another half an hour. When I went up there, he, he said, I've, been, I've had my eye on you for some time, time now, and I love the tracks that you're playing of your own music here. He said, but I'd love you to but choose the extras and style the video what I'm doing. Um, and he said, if you're interested in doing it, you'll be paid, da, 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 and you have to meet up at the Hilton Hotel at 6 a.m. And the Hilton Hotel, don't forget, we're only like earning 150 quid a week, which in them days was like mega bucks of money, mega bucks. Like, we thought we were loaded. Um, but the Hilton was like another step up. And meeting outside the Hilton, you're thinking in your head, he must be flying to Bar Bar Barbados or somewhere to shoot this video. Little did we know the bus was taking us to South End. <laughs> but, and, but he did actually close the beach. He hired the beach for the day. But the bulldozer that kept pushing me along the beach, I made that synonymous move, which was like, ah, was because the, the robe, the ecclesiastical robe I had on, kept getting caught in the bulldozer and was pushing me. And if I didn't actually do that, I, the bulldozer would have actually had me underneath it, so I had to make that move, which he later copied and put into fashion. Mm. Was, there, was there a brief for the style and the makeup of that video that he 
gave to me and was it free reign? No, he, he said to me, I'm, I'm going to be very cheap now and ask you something else. He said, can I borrow what you call your secret weapon? And I was like, Richard Shara left us going for a load of outbounds. But I obviously, I had to tell Richard, and Richard was, oh, I'm there. <laughs> oh, I'm there. <laughs> uh, and I, mean, I suppose some, you know, working with him as well, but one thing that pissed me off is that um, Fader Grey was already in the can mm. when we'd actually done Ashes to Ashes. Mm. And when Ashes to Ashes, when Fader Grey came up, everyone said, oh, copy, you know, like Ashes to Ashes. It was the other way around. Okay. So you, you, you mentioned that now he steals ideas. Oh, uh, he's a very clever mic fight who have, he admits it as well, yeah. which is, I suppose, one honest tra trait about him, that he'll, like, get into sort of sub subcultural scenes that are sort of happening. I mean, the Low album, for instance, is very much Frankfurt, but Berlin, sorry, Low, and it was very much inspired by Frank. My mind is going completely now. But it was very German-inspired. Um, and um, hung around with Crawford for quite some time, and then you get the sort of the lust for the lust, no, sorry, he did lust for life. But I mean, there's certain people like Lou Reed, Big Pop, that he hung around with and developed, and actually become like synonymous for like creating them. But what he was really doing was la latching on to them. Okay. Um, so you've been called a dandy, and. Prince of the 1980s Clubland, and obviously. And the princess. And the princess, of course. <laughs> uh, and the pioneer of, of New Romantic. What did you want to be when you grew up? Prince, what do you mean, alright? I'm a queen, but <laughs> I've been called that as well. <laughs> did you have any vision when you were living in Wales? Any, any kind of aspirations? Escape. Escape. <laughs> On the first train. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what, what brought you to London? You said you were working. The kind of punk and sex pistols, was there something you went to London to find or to see, or was it literally just to move away from home? It was like a, it was like a like a bus trip, a Welsh outing really. <laughs> um, and we sort of found this road called the King's Road. Yeah. And it was like a magnet for I think all, all urchins and mag whatever. And um, it just sort of goes to the I never got the money from I don't know, but we used to get the money to buy the most amazing clothes and you know, you just save your money and like then I started working for Vivian, so I was sort of allowed certain things which went missing and didn't get taken back. Um, but um, it was King's Road Dam is nothing like it was now. I mean at the time they had like um, petitions in the King's Road saying no, no, like, Marks and Spencers, no CNAs, nothing. Mm -hmm. They wanted to keep it very Chelsea, very, um, like, very traditional Chelsea market, like, very, like, at the attractions where the, all the, 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 the brilliant the Chelsea design, young Chelsea designers um, sort of spread their wings and developed in Axiom and Chelsea Market, as I said. It's a bit like what's happening with Soho now. Like, so they're taking everything out of Soho and stripping it and trying to make it glamorous. It's the whole of London to me is just changing completely. But I guess at the time when you were on King's Road, it was kind of a punk, the DIY. Was, was it really an ethos of DIY at that point? Yeah, I mean, completely. <coughs> I mean, when I finally moved to King's Road, and I was earning my own money because really, when I was working for Vivian, or when I was working for Malcolm, Malcolm never, Malcolm McLaren never really gave the kudos for anything like creative that I was doing. It would always be any posters that went up. It would always be, because after me came Jamie Reed, and I was there when Jamie came on board for the Anarchy in the, U uh, the, Anarchy in the UK tour. Um, that was when I was just about leaving, but I still stayed working for Vivian. Vivian mm -hmm. uh, was a lot less, Vivian was more mothering. She was, she saw something in me where she like wanted to mother. Mm -hmm. Whereas Malcolm wanted to say anything he could for me and bring it out and take the credit for it. Interesting. 
So, I mean, obviously there is an influence in Visage with punk. Punk is in there somewhere. And you've also got influences like Rich Kids and, and, and Magazine. If punk hadn't happened, do you think Visage would have, would have happened? Would it have been, been created? I think if Mitch hadn't seen me when I was in my original band, The Photons, I don't think... The Photons were um, a band created by the very famous punk entrepreneur called Andrew Chbosky, who then after punk opened up a very famous gay, big, one of the biggest gay clubs in Brixton, later on called Fridge. Uh, he had always wanted a band, he had tried to get me to, to go to audition and be the lead singer, but in the end I just thought, just to keep me quiet, I just thought, what the fuck is that, I'll go for an audition. And I went for the audition and he said to me, we're going to do the tour now. So, well I said, so if we're breaking away from punk, what are we going to be wearing? So what is the thesis behind this? I was like, if it's not punk, what we were rehearsing was like, what had been terminated as power bomb. Okay. <coughs> and I was sort of responsible for some of the tracks. He had written some of the tracks with uh, the, the bass player. Um, but his idea of being creative was putting me in a bright red suit, which I ended up wearing for about 13 days of the British tour. And then we had four days off but, uh, for the London gig, because I knew there was going to be like the who's who rock from the clash to see the banshees to the sex pistols to the slits i just knew that johnny thunder was <coughs> there because everyone was going to be there for my london debut i thought there's no way i'm going to wear that red suit i have worn it for like 13 like night, nights and a short british tour and i'd gone to this friend of mine celia and asked her to come up with this mad sort of like slash bright red, perspex, like trousers, plastic, plastic zip pockets. Um, if you let the pockets down, not just show, if I didn't have underwear on, my arse wouldn't show. And then, like, the jumper was very much, like, a bit like ruffles, but not really, it was knitted, but with, like, lots of, like, slashes just hanging off. You know, simple, mm -hmm. but none of the band knew what I was going to do. And I decided at sound check to take the bag with me. And then just before we went on stage, I went into the toilet, took off the red suit, put this whole suit on. But they were banging on the door saying, Steve, come on, you're up, we're on stage. And I'm like, the place is full, the place is full. When I come out, come out of the toilet, the whole band went. <laughs> What's he doing now? And it was just like, I just grabbed the mic and just went into sort of my persona of releasing of the photons. Afterwards, in the dressing room, with everybody coming back, stayed saying it's brilliant, really great. And then Mitch came and said, um, I think you've got a brilliant voice and I'd really like to do something with you. In the studio, I've got some free studio at EMI, it's just studio time, would you be interested? To be honest, I knew there was nothing going to happen with the photons and I was, I was quite glad it was the last gig was in London and I was quite good, glad that I'd done what I did. And the reviews came out and it was really good what I'd done and it sort of set the way for the full visage because when I went and used the studio time with Midge it was at the same time we were just about opening Billings so we had already we were creating the music which we were about to play. So the music became synonymous to what we were opening with the clubs. So although we were playing Nina Hagen, Kraftwerk, uh, Lizzie and the Sacred Crop, stuff like that, we were actually creating that music as well. So, and feeding into the clubs. Yeah. And, and, and I guess an extension of, of, of a blitz or maybe another incarnation by one of the blitz kids, Taboo, um, which, as we see now, is back on, back on stage in Brixton. How does it feel to be immortalised in interviews? I have a really funny story to say. Um, obviously, when somebody's playing you in, in something, um, in a musical, something that is called char character analysation, mm -hmm. so you have to spend a couple of top days with the person that's going to be playing you. 
Boom, uh, I had a call from George, which was not Mr. Boom, when it opened originally. And George rang me and said, Steve, whatever you've done, the guy's not going to open the show tomorrow night. And I goes, why? And he goes, because the way we've written you in the show. And I goes, well, how have you written it? And he went, well, maybe you're not going to like the way we've written you. Because the guy said, I can't play him because he's a nice guy. I said, well, yeah, I am a nice guy. He went, no, but we've written you in the show a like, bit of that twisted, <laughs> like a strict bastard on the door that, uh, that had this power of authority that used it. So I said, well, I'm not surprised he doesn't want to play me. <laughs> anyway, he said, can, can you please not just tell him that it was the 80s, it was excess. So I ended up doing it for that same year. The 80s, everything was excessive, you know, everything was labels, uh, you know, and after the blitz it went full swing, but, like if you didn't have Yamamoto or Comedy Garcon on, it would have gone from being like literally from, uh, uh, like I said, a theatrical costumist mm -hmm. to you had to be seen in like labels, it went from one end to another. Sure. It's interesting you talk about kind of the perception of you being a bitch and in real life perhaps you're not. Um, and Robert Elman, the journalist, talks about your kind of dramatisation in, in about a boy, George's teen years, George Boyd's teen years. Do you think that that characterisation in um, about a boy, do you think that was accurate of you at the time? With Mark Warren? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> not, not at all. So. No, I think I was 18 and I think Mark, Mark Warren looks as old as I look now. <laughs> and whoever did the makeup should have been shot. Because <laughs> they cake the makeup. I mean, the makeup is caked on in that picture, I know, but I mean... Um, Were you really as vicious as people? No, not no. at all. And I never had that policy feeling someone's was honest to see if they could get it. <laughs> um, and also, kind of still thinking about Taboo, I mean, Lee Bowery is a legend of, of Taboo, of... Even the Blitz and the whole kind of Soho scene at that time. That is another thing which is not completely true. Okay. Lee, Lee was not, never around. Lee came to um, England because of the Blitz. Um, he came out of the Blitz, had been taken. I left to open the Club for Heroes again, a much bigger club, from 300 to 750. And I think maybe by the time Lee had come, I opened the Camden Palace, which was 2000. <coughs> And um, Lee had come, and on the demise of the Blitz closing, I um, had saw a, a segment there, because we were then sort of, I can say it without it sounding a bit fickle, we were sort of, we were sort of courting rock royalty, we were sort of court, courting royalty. I mean, our guest list was like the creme de la creme of royalty, of the music. I mean, one review of the Camden Palace said, um, if Steve Stranger's house or the Camden Palace went up on a Tuesday or a Thursday night, so was half of club land and music mm -hmm. land, because my house was known as Party Central. Mm -hmm. So after the club finished the Camden Palace, they'd all end at my house until six, seven, eight, nine the next morning. And, um, so Lee sort of catam came in to, we were catering then to sort of like the masses as well, where we sort of, we created a niche market, which we were sort of elaborating, like Tuesdays and Thursdays were like very trendy and hip, and then the rest of the night, 2,000 people, you can't give that exclusive and trendy, and you've got to, you've got to get the people in. So I think when Lee had came in and, and started to boo, which was had the basis in the format of being a very small club with the same door policy, and that's when Lee had come over from Australia. Mm -hmm. Thinking about kind of Party Central and your house, do you still, still go clubbing now? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would, yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, just there's nowhere to go. I mean, I get really bored when I go to London now. I mean, it's not that I'm bored like old Joe that doesn't want to go out. I mean, we were talking last night about the box and places mm -hmm. like that. But the box is all to do with money. It's nothing to do with about creation. It's nothing to do about being young and vibrant or old and with ideas. It's just about money. And how do you feel about shortage? 
just because I'm not that trendy, not that knowledgeable with sword sure. it's just um, it's people that <laughs> are quite commonly known or know the roundabouts of Knightsbridge and Chelsea, that's where people live in Shoreditch go. <laughs> so thinking about what's happening now with you, I mean, what are your current musical influences? Um, I suppose things like Fish and Spooner, Goldfra, um, I dare to say the room. I mean, people that have actually said that, that when, it, when, it, when it wasn't hit, that um, if it wasn't for bands like Visage, there wouldn't be this electronic scene. Mm -hmm. And we became more hit mm -hmm. in sort of 1999 than we would, we were never hit in the sense of music credibility in the sense of enemy or melody maker because we never needed them. Um, the melody maker and the enemy only gave you credibility if they actually discovered you in a sense. They, you became the darlings of them, their, their musical papers. If they found you, then they built you up to knock you back down again because we never needed that. I mean, we were never hit with them sort of papers. How do, how do you feel about contemporary pop music today and the artists that are making contemporary pop? Um, <coughs> I don't really listen to that much. I have a very, very widespread taste in music. I mean, I will sort of listen to... I like to listen to people with really great voices. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I do listen to what is conceived as electronic art. and I will listen to like if there is uh, like a, there was just a new Carbrook album released not, not so long ago. Um, but all X Factor, and also if I'm in the studio, they're, they're, that, they're fine tuning my voice. I'm like, oh, stop it! I hate all this shitty fucking. Fine tuning, <laughs> making me sound like a robot. I want to. I want to have some grit in my voice. You spoke about this particular person last night, and the next question: Is there anybody you would let, let into the Blitz Club? <clears throat> I'm thinking about Lady Gaga. Um, what, what are your thoughts on on her? Um, it's not my thoughts on her. I mean, what she does is, to me, I think she's very. Uh, she's got. Uh, uh, she's very. Clued up, very savvy, and she's very business orientated. It's not that. It's like when I show my pictures to the DNA about getting a book deal, they're like, no, that's Gaga 30 years ago. And I, no, that, that's Lady Gaga. I'm like, no, that's 30 years ago. Well, that's Rihanna. No, that's 30 years ago. And they go, well, that, well, that's Hartman. That was last year. No, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's nothing. It, it, I mean, what has it been done? I mean, I can't say that what I created was like completely unique. Everything goes, if it, in all honesty, if everyone's being honest, you look at history books mm -hmm. and you sort of reinvent certain things. I mean, there's pictures which are going to be in the blank canvas where I'm punching myself in the face and I'm bru 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 bruised and I've got punching gloves but I'm wearing body mask and there's like blood all over and then I've got like access, no area. And that's where they say, oh, look, Rihanna, you know, 30 years ago. Oh, and you look, you look back in history for your references at that time. Um, sort of, yeah. I mean, a lot of my history, especially with the French Revolution, Robinson Crusoe, Robin Burge, and Rob the Rich, Rob the Poor. Mm, of course. So, <coughs> maybe a bit of a fickle question. <coughs> What's more important to you, either then and now, getting ready or going out? Um, I, I'd like to say if I could do it all again I would of course I would um, I don't crave the years I'm not a person that's like that I'm just glad that I'm still here to actually tell the tale <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't be <laughs> but what I've put through my body <laughs> and um, 
I'm glad I can still actually remember it. But there is uh, another book coming out called Flips, The Forgotten Years, Now Remembered. Not by me, but by friends of mine who are telling me from the original book, and so their stories were forgotten. And last but not least for me, are there any other things in the pipe, any secrets that you can tell us about? Or is the album and the two books, is that more than enough for your time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and getting a new look together and a new make bias. Yeah, that's, that's the first on the cards. Hey, busy boy. So I think there's now time for maybe 10, 15 minutes worth of questions from all of you. Don't be shy, I don't mind. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Who wants a question for us? Okay, at the front here. Um, what used to inspire your style and makeup? Okay, so the question was, what used to inspire your style and makeup? Um, I think I answered it by saying we were very lucky by having uh, theatrical costumers. But um, before we found that costumers, um, I was working and designing clothes, but luckily through the help of Billion West for a company called PX. A lot of my inspiration came from ca such characters as Robin Hood, uh, Robin T. Crusoe, uh, Dandies, really. So I suppose a lot of that would, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, what, were there any weird things you used on your face, like your makeup? Like, what sort of, you quite like what kind of things you Yeah, um, I was telling the students today a couple of tricks. Um, for my book cover, which I was really pissed off about, not um, not for the hardback, the paperback cover, I was it was it came out um, the Blitz came out in 2001 in hardback and went to number two in the bestseller. So then I had to reinvent myself for it coming out in paperback, and I had this idea of Metallica because Stephen Jones made a virtual copy of this hat but metal, and then I decided that my lips were going to be metal. And that uh, when you get um, drawing pins, um, I stuck drawing pins with super glue all on my eyebrows, drawing pins all on my cheekbones, and stuck drawing pins in the two middle parts here. And it was great for air kissing. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually um, airbrushed it. And I was like, when it came out on the bookshelves, I'm like, where are all my pins gone? And they actually airbrushed it and said um, it was dangerous for children. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Okay, at the back. What would you say would be your craziest outfit that you really like wearing? That I really like wearing? Yeah, what would be your craziest outfit that you really like wearing? That one. <laughs> caused the most, uh, let's just say, the most hiccups was the one on the Ashes to Ashes video, which was blamed on the church, let's just say it was blamed on the church and religion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else at the front here? What is your favourite memory of the Blitz period? <coughs> um, just how unique it was, and uh, how nobody that actually started to go to Billy's, that we, when it moved to the Blitz, we didn't realise what we were actually creating. We didn't realise that we had the elite of not just St. Martin's, like Galliano or Melissa Catherine and Stephen Jones, but we had like the creme de la creme of the fashion industry. Um, interior designers, Stephen Jones, the milliners, um, John Galliano, and we were pioneering a new music, and so, like, Depeche Mode, Visage, Spandau Ballet with a house band, and then obviously it sort of branched out. So, it, yeah, it became such a brilliant time. Thank you. Question that from that. Um, I remember, uh, well, like, I'm old enough to remember that time, and um, uh, I then subsequently went to, into working in the theatre, but I was really into Romantics because it was very theatrical, and you talk about the link with the theatrical costume years and the way that influenced how you looked. But was there a sense in which you felt that you were making theatre, that you were you were creating characters and performing characters as you would on stage when you went out to the nightclubs? 
Yeah, we used to have a saying, you know, like for people that we, I mean, obviously we were the freaks to the nine to five people, like the, what we used to call the norm. Um, but to, to, in our heads, that we were the we were the normal, and they, they were the freaks. So our saying was, "What are you looking at? We're on stage twenty four seven, and it was it was like opening up. Uh, you walk up in the morning, it was like, well, who am I going to be today? And you know, it was like you could have your pick of, oh, well, maybe I'll be walking for this, or shall I be Robinson Crusoe, or maybe I'll be Little Lord Fauntleroy, or shall I be?" Russian Revolutionary or something it was like that, yeah, very much. And would you adapt your behaviour to the costumes you were wearing? I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe time Apart for from the time that I was a whore. <laughs> <laughs> maybe time for just two more questions, Catherine, first, and then we'll come here. Um, as you were talking about how the clubs kind of got bigger as you went along, it sounds like you almost discovered that maybe a, a, an instinctive mouse for the, the business of running clubs. Yes. Were you literally counting the door money at the end of the night? Because as it, I, I have a small shop, I sell vintage clothes, and I struggle with this, I want to be this creative person, but you've got to pay the bills. And was that your role, or was there any, somebody else that did that bit for you? I think it, part of it was our role um, in the niche of what we were seeing. Um, by the time we moved to Club of Heroes, we were still inventing the, the thesis of the, the creme de the creme of the new young designers and spearheading and choosing designers by showcasing them, by letting them show their clothing at our nights. Then we got asked by uh, Nightclub in Limited if we would front a huge venture, which I said to my partner, 2,000 people a night, crazy. And, you know, I was like, oh, we're going to have to let in Tom, Dick, and Harry. So when we looked at the place, and they told me it was a place called The Music Machine, my first reaction to that was, that's a shit I like, I'm not having anything to do with that. And then they said, well, look, you're going to be a shareholder, you're going to have a top lunch with a design. So when they said that to me, that I'm a shareholder, and I can actually do the interior design, because it used to be known as a rock venue called The Music Machine. And you literally... To go to the bar, you had to wade, or if you wanted a piss, you had to wade through like six inches of piss to have piss. And it was like that, from the toilets to the bar, it was just a shit hole. But we changed it and it became again the club, uh, but it, it was, you sort of hit on the nail, it was like more like a business venture. But I think what happened with the Cannon Palace, what, without sounding big headed, I think. The reason the Camp Palace took off in the way that it did was because my career, being the lead man in Visage, I was in four countries in one day, so nobody really knew when I was going to be at the Camp Palace. And it became sort of like, is he going to be there or not? Is he going to be there or not? And of course, we had a, a set takings of a weekly amount that we took, but anything above that 5% got put into a bank. A bank account, which nobody was allowed to touch. Thank you. And from here? Um, if you, if the new romantics like stemmed from the punk scene, what happened? What came next? What fizzled out the new romantics? Um, I don't think it fizzled out. I think it was more bands latched on to the new romantics. Um, like it just became global. It became it wasn't just a London thing anymore, it was Scottish, it was Birmingham, it was Wales, and you know, from Cardiff you had the Royal Alistair, from Birmingham you had Duran Duran and Buck Joe Boxers, from Scotland you had the Associates, all brilliant bands, but I mean it was all, it was all spear branching off, and it was all, if I'm being honest, it was basically happening very quickly. <coughs> If I had my time again, I think I'd sort of take, sit back and savour it more. It was just like a whirlwind to that. I just didn't know where I was some days. You know, it was like, you, who can be in four countries in one day and think, where the hell am I now? Okay, so one more question and then we'll wrap up. Mm. Um, if you could go back, would you do it all the same? Or is there anything that would be different? Uh, there was one drug that I would never take if I uh, <laughs> went back. 
I am, and in fact, I don't really want to go there, but I mean, it's not a nice drug, and I've got a... It's been well documented, but it's like having the devil on the back, and that's the one thing that I would never want to get involved in again. But I'm luckily, whichever way you take this drug, it's like having the devil on your back, and I've got a phobia of needles, so I never had it that way, but I, whichever way I had it, it was bad enough. Okay, so, I think we are very lucky to have had Steve for such a long time. I would like for you to put your hands together to thank you for this.